Are we ready? We're we lost ready. you. All right, we lost you. Uh, this is Congressman Lowenthal. And I want to wish I say hello, everyone. Good morning from California. Good afternoon if you're in the East Coast. I want to thank all of you for joining us today from across the country for a very important joint virtual forum between the Subcommittee on Energy and Mineral Resources and the Subcommittee on Water, Oceans, and Wildlife. We're here today with Chair Huffman, Chair Grijalva, and other members of our subcommittee to hear from Alaskans who are experiencing the devastating impacts of climate change firsthand. We all know that climate change is a very real threat. Here in California, more than three and a half million acres of land have burned so far this year with fire season still underway. Hurricanes are hitting the Gulf with higher frequency and higher intensity than ever before. But far north, Alaska and the Arctic are warming at a rate that's twice the global average. The impacts that people in the lower 48 are now noticing are sadly old hat for those in the far north. Every year brings new horrors. Just this year, we had 100 degree days in Siberia. Imagine that, 100 degree days in Siberia. Out of control wildfires and the lowest amount of July sea ice ever in the Arctic Ocean. Towns are melting, uh, food sources are disappearing, and environments are changing in ways that are making people's homes nearly unrecognizable. Even entire villages are being forced to relocate. Newtok, Alaska, a coastal native village of almost 400 people, if you can imagine, this is losing 80 feet of land per year. Flooding and mold causes health problems for the young and the elderly. And a, two a 2019 report found that Newtok could be entirely uninhabitable within the next few years, not a decade, few years. Relocating Newtok will cost about $200 million, but with no clear federal leadership, the community doesn't know where that money is going to come from. Climate change is impacting subsistence resources too. Disappearing sea ice and raised temperatures are affecting whales, caribou, and other animals that many villages depend upon for their food supply and for their way of life. These impacts would be devastating enough Yet the Trump administration continues to make things worse by pushing for more exploitation of Alaska for its oil and gas resources. On Alaska's North Slope, oil and gas development is an immediate threat. The North Slope is home to some of the most fragile ecosystems on earth. But villages like Nuiqsut, located right next to the National Petroleum Reserve, Alaska, are increasingly surrounded by development. Back in 2013, the Obama administration finalized the plan for the, uh, for the, for the National Petroleum Reserve, Alaska, which balanced some oil development with the protection of essential subsistence resources and particularly fragile ecosystems. It's no surprise that just a few months in, the Trump administration chose to scrap President Obama's compromise, and I quote, jumpstart energy production. The Trump administration's new plan would open up more than six and a half million acres to leasing. Further east in Alaska, on the coastal plain of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, we're fighting another battle with the Trump administration to protect sacred and fragile land. Over a year ago, the House passed H.R. 1146, my colleague, Representative Huffman's bill, 
which would permanently ban oil and gas drilling on the coastal plain. Protecting this land is a priority for House Democrats because we know that the damage from oil and gas development, particularly on the tundra in the Arctic, is irreversible. For the Gwich'in people, this place is sacrosanct. They call it the sacred place where life begins. We will hear from one of their leaders today to tell us why we can't let this place be exploited. Unfortunately, just a few months ago, the Trump administration approved plans to offer oil and gas leases across all 1.6 uh, million acres of the Arctic Refuge's coastal plain. The federal government could, au could auction off this sacred land before the end of this year. But why now? Why are we doing this now? We don't need the oil. Over the past few years, we've seen record uh, levels of domestic oil and gas production, and we don't need the emissions. We are experiencing devastating climate disasters in what seems like every single day in this country. There is absolutely no need to open the Arctic refuge to oil and gas drilling. What we need to do is to protect this land permanently and move forward with a plan to assist the communities that are already being devastated by climate change. With that, I want to again thank our panelists for participating in today's forum and I look forward to having a meaningful discussion. I will now recognize Representative Huffman, Chair of the Subcommittee on Water, Oceans, and Wildlife, for a five-minute opening statement. Welcome, Chair Thank you, Chair, thank you, Chair Lowenthal. Um, thanks for your leadership, and good morning or good afternoon to everyone, depending on where you're logging in from today. I would like to thank our panelists for joining us to share their experiences and knowledge. And one of the few silver linings that we get uh, from this pandemic and doing remote work um, is the ability to amplify voices from so far away, especially when we can do that safely without endangering them and their communities in the midst of this public health crisis. Uh, under Chairman Grijalva's leadership and in these subcommittees, we don't recklessly put people at risk, tempt fate or flout science uh, in our work. Of course, I wanna thank Chair Lowenthal for co-hosting this forum with me and for that excellent overview that he just gave of the problems facing the Arctic. As President Trump continues to deny science and to wish away the climate crisis, reality is winning the argument. The millions of Americans experiencing wildfires, hurricanes and flooding are all too aware this crisis is real. They're living it. And nowhere are the impacts more pronounced than the Arctic where the changes that Alaskans have been experiencing in recent decades are starting to accelerate at an alarming pace. The permafrost that's supposed to be frozen year round in the North Slope is thawing out. The 2017 study in the scientific journal Nature talks about how climate change has, uh, is impacting that area and suggests that for every 1.8 degree Fahrenheit of warming, we'll see an additional 1.5 million square miles of permafrost lost. Now that is a big deal, not just because uh, thawing permafrost destabilizes infrastructure in Alaska, changes the landscape for wildlife, but it's also a big deal for the planet because it releases a lot of greenhouse gas as ancient organic material that's been trapped for thousands of years in the permafrost thaws out and decays. Obviously we're seeing more wildfires. Chair Lowenthal talked about that. 2019 was a record breaking year and 2020 has shattered that record. Researchers did not expect to see this frequency and severity of Arctic wildfires until mid century. In addition to threatening lives and infrastructure and wildlife, these Arctic wildfires burn away the protective vegetation from the permafrost. And so it further thaws and destabilizes this important landscape. And perhaps the most well-recognized symptom of our climate crisis is the disappearance of sea ice. Uh, Chairman Lowenthal talked about how this year is on track to set another 
grim record. And again, experts didn't expect to see this level of sea ice loss uh, anywhere close to this soon. They're talking about maybe now seeing sea ice free summers by 2030. Now this carries ramifications from ecosystem collapse to shipping and national security. Alaska natives who have relied on sea ice for subsistence hunting and transportation for millennia are now facing rapid fundamental changes to their way of life and to their culture. Offshore from Alaska, over half of US fish are caught with an average wholesale value of nearly $4.5 billion a year in this region. But Alaska fisheries are facing climate related challenges from ocean acidification, harmful algal blooms, and rising temperatures that are changing the distribution and the abundance of fish. Salmon are at especially high risk because of their life cycle, which requires time in the ocean and also inland freshwater ecosystems. And so they have unique challenges. Climate change has huge consequences for this massive industry and for Alaska natives and coastal communities who depend on healthy oceans and fish. Now you'd think with all of these very real climate impacts happening in the Arctic that the United States would be at least trying to address the crisis rather than making it worse, but you'd be wrong. The fossil fuel extraction and burning that is killing the planet and wrecking the Arctic is moving faster and more recklessly than ever under the Trump administration with no concern for the consequences. Now, back in 2016, President Obama issued an executive order establishing the Northern Bering Sea Climate Resilience Area, which was supported by over 70 federally recognized tribes. The area has been relied on for subsistence fishing and hunting for thousands of years. It supports millions of marine mammals, fish and birds, in an all too familiar turn of events, in 2017, President Trump revoked the order without any tribal consultation, clearing the way for more oil and gas leasing, industrial shipping, and bottom trawl fishing. As Chair Lowenthal explained very well, the Trump administration is also going after the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Now, oil and gas development in the Arctic is a one-two punch. Burning fossil fuels obviously makes climate change worse, especially in the Arctic, and the basic infrastructure and the process of development weakens the Arctic landscape. It makes it more susceptible to the impacts of climate change. So th these are complex issues. Uh, there are some places that we know are simply too wild to drill, and that is why that I'm so proud to have um, carried H.R. 1146, so proud that my colleagues here have joined me in that effort. This is the Arctic Cultural and Coastal Plain Protection Act, which would repeal the Republican oil and gas drilling mandate from their tax bill on the coastal plain of the Arctic refuge. The climate crisis is having real tangible effects on Alaska landscapes, ecosystems, wildlife, and most importantly, people. So I look forward to this discussion with our panelists today. They all bring firsthand experience about the dangers, the very real consequences of our greenhouse gas emissions. And it's through these conversations that we'll find tangible solutions and build momentum for this cause. So uh, thank you, Chairman Lowenthal. And uh, I will now introduce our panelists. Our first panelist is Ms. Mary David. She is the Executive Vice President of the Cowrack Inc. Our second panelist is Ms. Chairman Rose Chairman Huffman. Yes, Before Alan. Before you do that, and then you can take over, I'd like to introduce Chair Grijalva for his five-minute statement. Oh, of we'll course. I am sorry for my oversight. I will stand down and we'll get right back to the witness introduction. And then we'll get back right back to you, Chairman yeah. Huffman. Thank you. Chair of the full committee, Chair Grijalva, you're now recognized for five minutes. Forgive me, Raul. No, 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 no. I want to thank both Chairman Huffman and Lowenthal for, for, for putting this uh, forum hearing together. It's very important to hear directly from um, the people impacted. Both of you have outlined what we're dealing with and, and the task ahead, given the right composition after November 3rd is to codify into law, Mr. Huffman's legislation, to codify executive orders that uh, a previous administration put in place to permanently uh, get on the path to protect uh, the Arctic and, 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 and the areas that, 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 uh, that 
the refuge and, and, and the North Slope. And I say that because uh, that's the job ahead. And today, I think we hear directly from people. I appreciate it. Uh, you know, this unfortunate, uh, this is a, the cause is unmistakably human induced climate change, uh, fueled by the greed that we see in the Trump administration. And, and instead of providing communities, uh, native Alaskan communities uh, with uh, support, uh, Trump administration is actively making the problem worse. Uh, and I uh, just, uh, through no act of their own, the climate change is creating a, a real crisis for Alaska natives who lived in the re region for countless generations, if not longer. So uh, I wanna thank you uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to the witnesses. And with that, uh, let me yield back Mr. Lowenthal. Thank you very much, Chair Grijalva. So uh, back to our witnesses. Uh, our first panelist will be Ms. Mary David. She's the Executive Vice President of Cowrick Inc. Cowrick Inc, I believe is the proper pronunciation. I've, I've been reminded. Our second panelist is uh, Ms. Rosemary Atungarak from the native village of Nwiskit, Alaska. And apologies for any mispronunciations <laughs> for any of this. Our third panelist will be uh, Ms. Bernadette Dementiv, and she's the executive director of the Gwich'in Steering Committee. Fourth will be Ms. Maka Monture Paki, the Programs and Movement Building Association for the Alaska Conservation Foundation, associate rather for the Alaska Conservation Foundation. And then our fifth and final panelist will be Mr. Joel Clement. Uh, he is the Arctic Initiative Senior Fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs and uh, a former top advisor to the Secretary of Interior with a unique personal perspective on uh, both these climate issues and uh, the way people are treated in this administration when they speak up about climate change. So welcome everyone. Ms. David, you're recognized for five minutes. Good, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I hope you could hear me all right. Thank you all for your opening comments. Esteemed members, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I was born and raised in Nome, Alaska. I'm a tribal citizen of Nome Eskimo community and I also serve on the tribal council. Our communities are located on the sea coast or river shores. The health of the environment strictly directly impacts the health of our communities through food security, safety, and through the continuation of cultural practices. People and tribes in the region take seriously the impact of climate change because our lives are so intertwined, connected, and reliant on the environment. I want to say that again. Our lives are so intertwined, connected, and reliant on our environment. We are the first people to know when change is happening in our environment. Marine life, such as the Pacific walrus, bowhead and beluga whales, ice seals, polar bears, fish, ocean plants, sea urchins, and seabirds are a vital and important source of food. Global climate change and Arctic shipping have a direct impact on these food resources we are reliant upon for food security. On your way home today, you might stop into a grocery store and pick up your dinner of hamburger, steaks, or chicken. And for the most part, you could be rest assured that the food you eat is safe. Our food is healthy and organic. It comes directly from the ocean, our rivers, and our land. The act of carrying out subsistence activities, as well as all the associated actions for prep prepping it, for storing it, are crucially important to the maintenance of our culture, social relationships, traditional knowledge, our indigenous language, and our physical and mental health and well being. Oiled wildlife, diseased animals, poor body conditions toxins at levels over federal regulatory limits, mortality events, and thinness has been observed in our food resources. And this summer, trash from abroad appeared on our shores. 
Imagine your beef exposed to these toxins, starving and looking sickly. I don't think that would be appetizing nor acceptable. It is clear climate change impacts our environment and our food source, but it doesn't end there. This impact is also causing life-threatening challenges for our subsistence hunters who are, are having to travel farther to find and harvest ice-associated marine mammals. They are needing to change timing for harvest for fish species because of lack of ice or the inability to harvest land mammals at certain times because there is not enough snow cover to use snowmobiles. The warming world has caused ice in the Bering Sea and Arctic Ocean to decrease, which has opened up shipping opportunities, thus increasing vessel traffic around our subsistence hunting gathering grounds. More vessels additionally cause increased pollution these challenges have been witnessed firsthand by hunters with decades of experience and observation. Severe superstorms seem to occur more frequently and more severely and rising temperatures has led to the thawing of the permafrost that holds our land together. Combined, this means disaster to infrastructure, communication outlets and essential goods and service delivery. Erosion threatens housing in entire communities. Hurricane force winds knock out power lines and communication towers. Tidal flooding may restrict flight service that brings in groceries and transport passengers who might need medical care. The impact of climate change can be felt not only across the land and the sea, but also through the lines that keep remote communities warm in the winter, illuminated in the darkness, and connected to the outside world. Power lines, power plants, and power generation systems are being greatly affected by climate change. As the earth continues to warm and the Bering and Chukchi seas experience changes our communities have not yet seen before, the energy infrastructure within these communities need to have the resilience necessary to withstand dramatic fluctuations in temperature, gale force winds, heavy snowfall, and the need to fend off the ever approaching sea. While Congress works to address the impacts of climate change and the changing Arctic, I respectfully request lawmakers to respect and honor our native way of life in the Arctic. Consult the tribes and honor our government to government relationship. Throughout history, indigenous peoples full symbiotic relationship to the land of Alaska has been threatened. At times it's by natural variation, but recently by human caused warming. The decisions you make also impact those of us who live thousands of miles away. For example, the bans on elephant ivory pushed by environmental conservation groups have increased have in have incorrectly included walrus ivory with significant impacts, economic impacts to us. I encourage your support of HR 1806, a bill that honors our native way of life and our life with walrus. We now struggle with conflicting values of cultural respect for our marine mammals and Western regulations imposed on us. Quarak has been in operation and advocating on behalf of the people of the Bering Straits region since 1971. We are a tribal consortium. We as a tribal consortium understand- We need to wrap that. up and, and move to the next panelist if that's okay. Yeah, I'm just about okay. with my last couple sentences. Yeah. We are a tribal consortium, understand we cannot address these concerns without the help of our federal partners. Kuliana, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Thank you very much. Uh, the chair now recognizes Ms. Atan Garak for five minutes. I'm not sure if we have video this. there, but I, we, we see you, uh, and I think we'll have you on audio at least. Thank you. We have internet troubles with this changing environment of ours. We uh, want to thank everyone. My name is Rosemary Tegelson, Kuliwalak, Kenyuan, Shukuralak, Shukurakto. I was named after many aunties. 
My mother was Mabel Minio Peterson, my father, Yulin Don Pierce, and my stepfather, Carl Peterson. Our connections to our families are very important in why we share our testimonies. Those that are listening from our lands and waters and in our state may know our families and where we come from. We share these stories because the generations before us have shared them with us. The importance of what's happening in our lives is about the health of us as people, our villages, and within our region and within our state. A few years ago, I broke through the ice, and the day I broke through, seven other people broke through as we were checking our fishnets. Never before had we had stories of elders breaking through. Two men elders broke through the same day I broke through. Our traditional stories had changed. What was supposed to have happened with the freezing of the ice and becoming our natural highways and transportation routes was not happening. But more concerning was this year, as I put out my fishnet, and last year, as I put out my fishnet, seeing the tremendous change to the health of the fish. I used to put my net out and maybe I'd get one sick fish in the season. But last year, every net I pulled out had a sick fish. Was it because of the changes to the environment, the increasing temperatures? Was it related to the changes that have happened in our water and the quality that's there? We know the sinkhole effect of air quality, how it draws the emissions from all over the world into the Arctic and draws it down with the snow and the air down into our ice, the rapid melting of the ice pack where there are contaminants that were released that caused some illness to these fish. We don't know. We were encouraged to work to help study and monitor, but the rapidity of change did not allow us. The concentration of the birds in our area. One of my elders talked about how the noise of the birds are not raising to the scales of decades past. The cacophony as the new birds are born and raise their voices into the sounds of the Arctic are not occurring. What does that mean for us? Maybe we see a few less birds, but we receive birds from every continent into the Arctic for renewal. If they are not renewing and returning to your lands and waters as stories are being told of massive die-offs. Are these issues related to the changes in our lands and waters? I'm very concerned because the concentration of these birds are not found in other Arctic countries. They're found in our region. The importance of the health of our people The beautiful sunrises that we see in the Arctic, the northern lights. Do we have reason for concern? I believe so. I talk about air quality and the changes that are happening to our community and the health of our people. When you have to stay up at night and offer breathing treatments to our people and you end up staying up all night because more people come in, you ask more and more questions. Is it the particulate that causing us problems? Is it changes to the warming of the air causing changes to us? All of these factors are contributing, but it's the breakdown of the social structures that cause me the greatest concern. When we do not have our foods to feed our families, we do not have our ice cellars to store the foods we need in the quantities we need them. Many others do not eat the types of foods we eat, but we need our foods to feed our families, to be the strong, healthy families that we have been. We cannot get the calories from other foods that can be bought from the store. We cannot get the energy that we need. When you see our families having struggling to harvest in traditional ways, when normally these animals are always found here, there's breakdowns 
in social structures. Just as we have gone without harvesting, the village of Anaktuvik Pass has been facing the same concern, and they are still fighting to find a way to protect their village. Their village is named because of where the caribou go to poop. And yet the migration has been impacted and not come to their village. We entertained hunters from their village to come to my village to help them to harvest. Even with the hardships we are facing in our community, we shared our resources with them traveling many extra miles to help them to harvest because the migration is not going to their village. These are not acceptable changes. We have so many concerns. I worry about the health of the caribou. My nephew harvested a sick one last year, a sick one last week. Our caribou are being impacted with the changes, whether it's emissions in the air, whether there's contaminants in their food, whether it's stress and strain on the lifestyle changes with the increased user conflicts that are happening in the lands and waters where they come to renew their next generation. All of these are contributing. My elders talked about the fish, how we could put our fishnets out in the water and pull in 300 fish in a 24-hour set. Those numbers have not come back to us, and yet the needs for those same fish continue in each of our families. The health of these fish, I could have taught a pathology class last year. They are so concerning when you're teaching children how to properly cut and prepare the fish and yet you pull the fish out of the net and instead you have to stop and talk about why this fish is abnormal. And yet you go to pull out another net and you see another sick fish with different abnormalities. It is very difficult, but yet the village to the west of us, their fish collapsed. Their fishery did not have the harvest that they needed because Ms. their Atta, migration are incompetent. We're, we're going to have more follow-up questions. I know we want to hear more about what you've experienced and what you've seen, but we've got to keep moving to the next panelist. So thank you for your opening remarks. And uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Ms. Dementif for five minutes. Welcome. Chairman Ossenhall, Chairman Huffman, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today on this very important topic of climate change. I'm Kuchakuchin and a member of the Kuchakuchin tribal government from Fort Yukon, Alaska. My mother is Betty Flitt from Fort Yukon and my great grandmother is Marcus Horace Moses from Old Crow Yukon Territory, Canada. And my grandfather, Daniel Horace, from Fort Yukon. I have five children and five grandchildren. I am the executive director of the Gwich'in Steering Committee, and I am here at the direction of my elders on behalf of the Gwich'in Nation of Alaska and Canada. Founded in 1988, the Gwich'in Steering Committee is a unified voice of the Gwich'in Nation speaking out to protect the sacred place where life begins, otherwise known as the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. We are caribou people. We rely on the caribou and the, per- and the porcupine caribou rely on the coastal plain. This is a human rights issue for the Gwich'in and for many other tribes and indigenous peoples whose voices are not being heard. The caribou are the foundation of our culture and our spirituality. They provide food, clothing, and tools and they're the basis of our song, stories, and dances. The ancestral homeland of the Gwich'in and the migratory route of the caribou are nearly identical. The spiritual connection we have with the caribou is very real. The survival of the Gwich'in depends on the survival of this herd. Our elders recognize that oil development on the, per- on the Calvin grounds of the Perkiban caribou herd was a threat to the Gwich'in people 
That is why in 1988, our nation came together for the first time in over a hundred years for a tradition, traditional gathering, excuse me. We decided that we would speak with one voice to protect the coastal plain. Our elders directed us to do it in a good way. Following their guidance, the Gwich'in Steering Committee has worked for over three decades to protect the sacred place so that our people have a future in our homelands. Oil and gas activities on the coastal plain is a direct attack on our way of life. It is our fundamental human rights to continue to feed our families and our ancestral lands and our practice our traditional way of life. I have watched as this administration has taken steps to try to hold a lease sale and authorize harmful seismic activities on the coastal plain. The Gwich'in spoke up and engaged sharing traditional knowledge about the, the, the devastating impacts of oil and gas would have on the porcupine caribou and the Gwich'in. We were ignored and disrespected. We have hunted and lived off the land far longer than anyone else. Our elders, our scientists, our elders are our scientists. Our science and our traditional knowledge tell us that oil and gas lease and exploration and development will damage the calving grounds. It will impact the um, quality, health, and av availability to our traditional resources like caribou and birds. We know that oil and gas activities will also impact the air, water, and lands. We watch as the as other areas on the North Slope dr dramatically changes because of industrial development. These changes continue to become more widespread and intense with every passing year as development expands. And as we are seeing great changes to our land and animals as a result of the climate change now too, the climate emergency in the Arctic threatens our food, our water and our future. Last summer, we had the first Arctic Indigenous Climate Summit in my hometown, Kuchaja, otherwise known as Fort Yukon. We heard from our elders, chiefs, hunters, and leaders about how things are changing and how it is impacting people. For example, fishing are not, fish are not returning to our rivers in the numbers that they used to. Last year, there was a massive fish die-off event in the Yukon River because of increased water temperatures, and the salmon died before they spawned. Fish also have diseases and sores on their bodies. And this year, um, families that usually get 100 to, to 180 fish got seven. Birds are literally falling out of the sky, dying. I understand it may be because they do not have enough food. Lakes in the Yukon Flats regions are disappearing because the ground below them is melting. These lakes are important for birds and wildlife like moose. We are seeing ticks on our moose and rabbits. They are killing them. They didn't used to happen, but with the warmer, longer summers, ticks are moving north. The ice is thinner and less predictable. People are falling through in areas that used to be safe and our hunters cannot go out as early or late in the winter and it's risky when they do. Wildlife is changing its mig migra migration route, both when it migrates and where it migrates. Wild wildfires are more intense, larger and more frequent now. They were days this summer when we couldn't even go outside. These changes are threatening our food security and our traditional practices. We live off the land. We eat moose, fish, birds, berries, medicine, and, and of course, caribou. When we do not have our traditional foods, our people get sick. We cannot share foods within our communities and between our communities, our culture suffers. When we cannot practice our traditional ways of life, it stresses our animals, our youth, cannot learn their heritage. I know we adapt, but this is too many changes too quickly. It's just in our animals, which is a threat to our way of life. All of this is happening now and the coastal plain is still undeveloped. Our elders told us that if the coastal plain is developed, it will harm the caribou. With so much already happening through climate change, we cannot risk any additional impacts of oil and gas on the coastal plain. The coastal plain is not just a piece of land with oil underneath it. It is the heart of our people. The coastal plain is not, <clears throat> our very survival depends on its protection. Now more than ever, we must protect the coastal plain so that the animals that rely on it, like the caribou and the birds can survive.
in the face of many changes. On behalf of the Gucci Nation, I say thank you, Masik Chow. Thank you very much, Ms. Dementev. Ms. Montour, you're recognized for five minutes. Welcome. Uh, um, I appreciate the speakers um, that have gone on before me. Um, my heart feels your calling and the resilience and responsibility you have as a direct reflection of your ancestors. So, uh, my name is Kirkayakte. I am Shlingatan Mohawk and I'm from Yakutat, Alaska. I am from the Raven Moriti and the clan of the Copper River in the House of the Owl. My father's people are from Six Nations in Canada, and I call in from Dena'ina land um, here in Anchorage, Alaska. I was fortunate enough to grow up in a place where the land was my first teacher and my maternal grandparents were the translators of the land. Um, we are Tlingit of Southeast Alaska and my people settled in Yakutat over a thousand years ago. Uh, we migrated from the north um, along the Copper River. We actually were Atna Athabaskan prior to becoming Tlingit. And everything about our village and our community, our culture is tied into traditional harvest of salmon, of our song and dance, of our language and our ceremony and geneal genealogy are, are tied to the environment. I remember as a child, um, we had this, uh, this wooden kitchen table and it was kind of broken because like it, it had like these wings that would flip up and lock. And if you're really talking to someone and you're leaning on it, it would break. And my grandfather would tell us these stories where he talked about how our Tlingit people trained to be strong. Um, he, he would talk about how our uncles would tell their nephews, Hinde Koku, which means to go into the water. And um, through this, our young men and also our women would practice this at times as well where they would go dip in the ocean water before sunrise. And it was in order to strengthen our body's tolerance to the wild cold of our land, um, we trained to adapt to our environment and, and not the other way around. I think this is a big contrast between our traditional practices and um, what's happening now. Our entire livelihood was tethered to our environment. And we understood that the foundation of a strong person mentally and physically um, humility and courage and resilience, um, these foundations and the environment are unable to be untethered. They are twisted up um, like, like seaweed, I suppose. Um, Alaska is on the front lines of climate change. You've heard from the strong, resilient and brave people that have spoken before me. The melting Arctic and the warming climate is just as much of a social and human rights issue as it is environmental. The melting Arctic is tethered to me in Southeast Alaska. And the melting Arctic is tethered to you in all the respective places you are from. Um, accelerate erosion and, and permafrost melt, the vast changes. And in Southeast Alaska, the mountains are losing their snow caps early. And that means that the water is flowing downstream out of season. Um, global scale modeling studies find that there's rapid changes in pH in the water. And it means that ocean acidification can increase enough by the 2030s to really, really significantly alter, alter our ecosystem. And in this ecosystem, um, our humans are a part of that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't use the word ecosystem in terms of saying it's something out from there. It's from the system that's our home. And these are the descendants of the animals that our ancestors lived upon. The cedar trees are dying and the climate of the Tongass is poised at the snow participation threshold. And that makes it very sensitive to small temperature changes. And while the Tongass absorbs more carbon than any other national rainforest, or sorry, than any other national forest, the Trump administration still wants to open up the Tongass for logging. And this is irreversible. And that's not, that's not unlike burning down someone's home and then saying, it's not personal, it's business. Indigenous people 
are not always present in the spaces that make decisions about the homes, the ecosystems we live in. And the Bureau of Land Management must delay decisions that cannot properly incorporate Indigenous perspectives. Members of Congress must listen to the Indigenous communities of Alaska when making decisions about our homes. It's our collective human right to have a world in the future. On plain Gunalchish, I'm out of time. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much for your testimony. The chair now recognizes Mr. Clement for five minutes. Welcome, sir. Well, thanks so much, uh, Chairman Huffman, and thank you to Chairman Grehelva and Chairman Lowenthal and all the members present for the chance to speak here about the transformation taking place in the Arctic. It's an honor to be in this lineup of, of speakers. Uh, so as the world rightfully frets about the ongoing impacts of a changing climate, the term climate change does not accurately describe what's happening in the Arctic. Snow cover is diminished. Mile thick ice caps are melting at an extraordinary rate. Summer sea ice, including the last of the multi-year sea ice, could be gone in less than 15 years. Permafrost, the frozen earth that's the physical underpinning of nearly one quarter of the Northern Hemisphere is quickly thawing and swallowing up roads, runways, and homes. Massive wildfires are burning both boreal forests and the tundra. Uh, the entire region is changing color from white to green and blue. As scientists warn of the catastrophic implications of warming in excess of 1.5 degrees Celsius worldwide, the Arctic is already locked into an estimated four to five degrees Celsius of warming by mid-century. So this metamorphosis has dramatic implications for ecosystems in the region. Early indications show that ecosystems are rearranging at every trophic level, from the tiny copepods to the massive Arctic whale, or or orca whales, which are venturing into the Arctic now, uh, and they're preying on whales and seals and disrupting the top of the food chain. Frequent accounts of mass bird and seal die-offs point to the increasing ecological impacts of starvation events and algal blooms. So the word change feebly misses the mark. The Arctic is transforming into a warmer, wetter, and less predictable climate state before our eyes. And not surprisingly, these changes are dramatically affecting the livelihoods and the subsistence way of life for the 4 million or so people who live in the Arctic. Some 10% of these people are indigenous to the region. Their families have learned to thrive in the Arctic over many thousands of years, as you've heard from the other speakers. Uh, but no humans have yet experienced this rate of change in the Arctic. And the Arctic communities are highly dependent. As Maka mentioned, they are part of these ecosystems that underpin their cultures and provide food, medicine, shelter, and clean water. And disruptions in these ecosystems have combined with social and physical disruptions to destabilize their way of life and increase their dependence on expensive resources from the South and put infrastructure and entire communities in immediate danger. And so it's tempting to describe these people as climate refugees, but they adamantly refuse to be characterized as victims and with good reason. Uh, they're not acting like victims. These frontline communities that you've been hearing from are our planet's climate change pioneers. They're finding ways to address rapid change that will inevitably inform similar efforts worldwide. Their innovative and forward-leaning initiatives range from language preservation and gender equality, food security, community energy planning, and renewable energy training. New tools uh, include an app that finds the safest route to travel across unreliable ice. Another, another one that allows users to geotag unusual or dangerous events and sightings. Uh, so the communities and the experts in the Arctic are doing everything they can to build a resilient Arctic in the face of change. But achieving resilience in the Arctic will require a comprehensive, innovative, and well-financed effort at all scales, and that includes the federal government. It should not fall to communities to make it work on their own. So agencies from interior to commerce and homeland security should elevate the role of indigenous knowledge, should foster the abilities of communities to frame and implement actions that suit their cultural and economic conditions, should provide resources to help them not only adapt to change, uh, but to shape it. Agencies should provide seats at the decision-making table for indigenous people and in the process acknowledge that in fact it's their table. And new policies and legislation should emphasize transparency and should, by the way, foster investments in public health and safety infrastructure, which is sorely lacking, uh, lacking in the north. So policies like the Paris Agreement and national actions may, able to, may be able to slow the rate of change in the Arctic after mid-century, but they will not reverse the transformation now under 
region enters this new and unfamiliar climate state, dramatically increasing risk across the region, it is imperative that the ambition and policy and planning efforts match the level of urgency. Random acts of adaptation are no longer gonna work. Decision makers have to innovate and implement adaptation and resilience strategies that are collaborative and inclusive. Policy measures should embrace the complexities of multiple knowledge systems, foster social justice, and directly engage and support communities faced now with these new and daunting challenges. But we must also acknowledge, honor, and elevate indigenous knowledge holders who, thanks to their unique way of understanding and occupying the earth, may in fact hold the key to an Arctic future we can live with and by extension, provide the roadmap we need to navigate change around the world. So thank you and Masicho, I look forward to the questions. Thank you, Mr. Clement. Um, we have a couple of uh, subcommittee members with time constraints. And so I'm gonna recognize them first with, with uh, the indulgence of our more senior members if that's okay. And, and we'll start with Congressman Levin and then we'll go to Congresswoman DeGette uh, before we come back to others. So uh, Congressman Levin, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to all my colleagues uh, for your indulgence. Uh, I wanted to uh, start uh, by uh, uh, asking uh, Mr. Clement a couple of questions. As the chairs have discussed, Alaska and the Arctic are warming twice as fast as the rest of the world. We're seeing temperature records set in the triple digits, all time record low sea ice levels in recent years and wildfires far worse than anyone would have predicted. Uh, Mr. Clement, why are these changes happening so quickly in the Arctic and should we be paying closer attention to worst case climate scenarios, both in the Arctic and across the globe? Thanks, Congressman. We actually, scientists have started saying the Arctic is warming three times faster than the rest of the planet uh, this, this year. Uh, so things are really picking up pace and accelerating. Uh, and the reason the Arctic is warming so much faster, there, there are a couple of reasons. The primary one being that the as the sea ice melts, it decreases the reflectivity of the Arctic. So you've got more heat absorption uh, in the Arctic and also uh, as has been well known by climate scientists for, for many years, the heat transport from the tropics to the Arctic region is a function of global circulation models, all those thunderstorms in the, in the tropics and so on. So heat migrates northward. That's why it's happening so fast. And frankly, we've outpaced most of the models for rapid change in the Arctic. So I would say, Congressman, that yeah, we should heed uh, the more uh, dire concerns that have been raised by scientists over the year. In fact, I think we've, because these changes have accelerated and outpaced the models, uh, I, would, I would be uh, careful to acknowledge uh, that the range of effects as dramatic as it is could be surpassed even than what's been predicted. Thank you for that. And uh, I recommend to, to all my colleagues and everybody watching, check out 60 Minutes uh, from last night. They had a great segment on climate change and they asked one of the scientists is there consensus on this? And he said, yeah, pretty much now the consensus is about the same as gravity existing, uh, whether or not uh, this is occurring. Uh, Ms. Dementia, I wanted to turn uh, to you. In your testimony, you describe horrible impacts uh, of climate change on the wildlife surrounding your village, uh, specifically between fish and salmon die-offs and diseases, birds falling out of the sky, ticks on animals in locations where it used to be too cold for ticks to survive. Sounds like a nightmare. How would increased oil and gas development impact the already struggling wildlife in your village? <clears throat> well, if you look at the developed areas up here in Alaska, all those herds have already declined, every one of them. And the porcupine caribou herd is still healthy in numbers. And so they can't tell us that our food security is not going to be impacted, not when we see differently. And it's the birthing and nursery grounds. This is sacred land to the Gwich'in. It's so sacred that during times of food shortage and um, starvation, we still never set foot there. So um, this is a, like a safety net. All the roads, all the um, structure, it will be damaged and there's nowhere else for them to go. Thank you for that. Ms. David, uh, over 70 federally recognized tribes supported President Obama's executive order 
designated, designating the Northern Bering Sea Climate Resilience Area. Uh, yet President Trump repealed that executive order, my understanding is without any tribal consultation. Can you uh, please tell us a bit more about the importance of the Northern Bering Sea Climate Resilience Area and why it's so harmful that the Trump administration eliminated it? Sure. Um, boy, talk about what a high and then what a low in such a short amount of time, it seems like. So the EO basically safeguarded the Northern Bering Sea, permanently establishing the ex existing bottom boundaries of bottom trawl fishing, requiring traditional eco ecological law knowledge and decision making, closing the area from oil and gas drilling in federal waters and establishing an advisory council that includes tribal representatives to guide federal decisions in the affected region. So the EO um, would have formally mandated the federal government to include us in the deliberations that impact the marine environment, which is like we've been stressing is so important to us. The an EO was the best idea we had to manage the extraordinary change that we are experiencing. It would have fallen short in addressing all of the changes that we have experienced since 2016 had it were implemented. But it would have allowed us to, it would have adapted to these changes. So the US, in the US, catcher pro processors that have accessed the Northern Bering Sea since 2018 have not transmitted their positions on AIS and are deploying thousands of hooks with unknown impacts for fish and wildlife, foreign debris impacts, food security, and, and will likely increase like we've had foreign debris show up on our shores this summer. The tribal advisory role within the NBSRCA would have given international collaboration some teeth and hopefully prevented what we have seen this summer. In Thank you. Think, yeah. I think we're running out of time over time, but I uh, wanted to uh, thank you for, uh, for that. And obviously we'll, we'll get all, all of your comments uh, in writing and I'll yield back to the chairman. Yeah, thank you, Congressman Levin. We'll now recognize Congresswoman DeGette who is a champion of Arctic protection, who's actually been to the coastal plain of the Arctic refuge. I think uh, she and I may be, you know, some of the few intrepid uh, uh, Arctic tourists who uh, have had that experience, but it's good to have you, Diana. You're recognized. Thank you so planet. much. And th thanks for your, all the committee members commenting. And let me just say a few words because I do have to do something else. And you stole, you stole my first words, which is you and I, and I now found out Congresswoman McCollum also has been to the to Anwar, but um, I want to say hello to my friend Bernadette Dimenchev, who um, who uh, has been in front of us so many times, and I was so honored to give recorded remarks to your uh, meeting this year. And I also um, I also really want to associate myself with what Ms. Montour had said about so often indigenous peoples don't have the right avenues of access into these decision making processes that impact their very being. And so I, as a member of Congress, um, not from Alaska, I find it very presumptuous that I would try to say what's going on. But yet, when I hear all of you talk about the tangible, you know, when, when I hear about elders falling through the ice, when I hear about the caribou and the health of the populations, only, only you know about this and only you are seeing on a daily basis the accelerating impacts of climate change. And it's so important for policymakers to hear that so we can understand this is not just some abstract concept that we have. This is your very, very being. And so thank you for coming and talking to us today. And I just want to say one other thing to my colleagues, because um, some of us have been working on these issues. I think when I went to Anwar now, it was like 20 years ago, believe it or not. And what has happened is that 
that these wonderful advocates who are here today and everybody else who they work with, they not only have to deal with the tangible impacts of climate change on their daily lives and on their very existence, they have to deal with Congress. How many, how many people do you know who have to come thousands of miles on a regular basis to Congress over and over again because the policies keep flipping back and forth to try to preserve their lives. So I, I, I just have to say thank you to every single one of you. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for being fighters for this. And you should consider us to be partners in your fight. We are not, we're not gonna go away. And we hope in the next Congress that we will have the opportunity to reverse some of these terrible policies uh, bef before they start to really take effect like the drilling, but also that we can enact robust climate legislation so that we can start begin to begin to reverse some of the real impacts that you're seeing. That's all I have to say and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Congresswoman DeGette. Uh, Chair Lowenthal, let's uh, take it back over to you. Hello, I think I'm now unmuted. First, I, I have to say I, I am so moved by all of the member, all the presenters and even the members' questions which bring out uh, the real unique perspective and the real importance, not only that I see that the federal government become involved, but that we listen to the people. We understand that the people want to adapt and to preserve their way of life. And it's really up to us to pay attention to where they are, not to, not to impose kinds of positions, even though this administration, rather than imposing, has actually created much of the problems that have occurred and actually are, are enhancing and, 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 and adding to the problems that the people have. So I have a few questions uh, about this. Ms. Ms. David, uh, uh, how could the federal government uh, work together to assist native villages in climate mitigation and relocation? What, what role can we play uh, and what role, and maybe any of the other panelists can answer. How, how do we work together? Well, one, I think it's a very complex and a very expensive endeavor. Um, there are some communities who do want to re relocate, but there are also some who want to stand and protect and remain in the homelands um, that they have uh, been in for some time. So, you know, our environment is changing. Um, there are um, some requirements that work for us and then some that uh, do obviously that do not. When a community um, request, uh, tribes can request a, to declare a, a disaster, but most do not because of, um, you know, there's oftentimes there's a federal government percentage that is covered, and then a state percent that is covered. So uh, tribes will not uh, declare a disaster because oftentimes they do just do not have the uh, funds that they may be required of them to address an issue. Um, so there's oftentimes some cost benefit analyses um, and some um, that just do not work with uh, tribal communities. Um, for example, in Shishmaref, we had a revetment project um, to protect a sewage lagoon and a washateria, and the tribe needed to come up with $8 million. Elam had a harbor project and the cost benefit analysis proved, proved not to pan out because it didn't create new jobs. Our tribes do not have a tax base. Um, we don't have gaming. So very, very uh, limited funds um, for tribes. I'm, I'm, 
I'm going to thank you for that. I just want to kind of move on. Uh, Ms. Monture, uh, I come from a mental health background, uh, but I've never had experience working with uh, uh, people who live in the Arctic and, and indigenous people from the Arctic. And so how would you explain how climate change is impacting psychologically their well-being? How would, yeah. how would you how would you deal do you is that a concept that's even meaningful um to have a home is meaningful yes to, it is your babies is meaningful to all aspects of climate change affect mental health through direct and indirect pathways the land is everything it is our meditation space it is our learning space it's our store, it connects us to our ancestors, our identity and our cultural practice. As Bernadette was sharing, um, those lands are so sacred that even in times of starvation, they honored the sacredness of those areas. It connects us to our humanity. And if someone was going to take away your home or your food or the location of which your child receives mental health care, of course you would want to protect it. Climate change threatens community well-being and food security and the cultural grounding that is absolutely necessary for their survival and healing and resilience when faced with the implications of historical trauma. As someone that has seen suicidal ideation among our men and women ourselves, having access to protection of these spaces is key to our survival. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, Chair Lowenthal. I'll now recognize myself for five minutes. And, and let me start by saying that um, we've heard some harrowing testimony from people whose lives are being dramatically affected already by climate impacts. Uh, I'm coming to you from Northern California where a lot of my district is either on fire or has been reeling from the impacts of by far the worst fire season in recorded history in California. We're not quite at, at the stage uh, of some of our uh, Arctic communities that we're hearing from where you worry about your ability to even continue existing and you start thinking about radical things like relocating entire communities. But I have multiple friends uh, who are leaving Northern California because of four consecutive years of terrible fire seasons. And there's something profoundly wrong uh, with these conditions that we are living through. So um, certainly uh, the testimony we've heard today resonates with me. Uh, these impacts are going to affect people uh, certainly dramatically in the Arctic, but it's not just the Arctic. And I think it's important that we remember that. I want to ask a question about the way this administration has taken a wrecking ball to the coastal plain and the Arctic refuge. We know that when they passed their tax bill in 2017, a lot of politicians and industry supporters um, talked about a postage stamp kind of impact. They talked about 2000 acres as a limit on surface disturbance. They assured us that uh, the impact on the ground would be tiny and that we should all just stop complaining. And uh, true to form, uh, they are now moving the goalpost when the Trump administration rolled out its record of decision for leasing, uh, they came up with a whole new interpretation of the language in their own bill, saying that it uh, <clears throat> that that only uh, refers to quote production and support facilities and not to roads, airstrips, exploration facilities, and more. So the truth is, uh, they're going to be allowed if they move forward. Uh, to impact a lot more than just 2,000 acres. It's a great example of why we should never take them at their word. And Ms. Dementif, I, I'd like to ask you what that means. Uh, what are the impacts of going so far beyond this 2,000 acre postage stamp uh, euphemism that we heard them use uh, during the debates over these things? What does that mean for the Gwich Inn and your way of life? Um, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to defend like, 40,000 years of history in five minutes, um, but I try. Um, you know, it's, we are interconnected to our land, to our water and to our animals. Um, they are the basis of our stories, our dances. And um, if you look like all of us are from different areas, 
but we have very similar stories. We still live off of our land and animals. And if the, um, one of our elders, Jonathan Solomon said, what befalls the uh, caribou befalls the witch in. If they go, we go. And um, our elders, you know, they know, they know the land. And they said, this place needs to be protective, not just for the Gwich Inn, but for other um, indigenous people, for other Americans and our, for our animals. Thank you for that. Mr. Clement, is there anything you'd like to add? And, and while you're at it, as I recognize you, um, I also want to note that the Washington Post reported uh, last week that the head of the US Geological Survey, Jim Riley, has blocked the release of a report about the danger to polar bears uh, from oil and gas exploration. So as you answer this question, I would invite you to share with us um, what this reflects about the way the Department of Interior under Secretary Bernhardt deals with science, particularly science related to the Arctic that doesn't uh, exactly support oil and gas development. Yeah, thanks, Congressman Huffman. You know, if, if there's two things that this administration has tried to keep its head in the sand about, one is uh, the rights and sovereignty of indigenous people, and the other is the role of science and decision making. And in the Arctic, they've it's been a poster child for how they can best set that aside. And as you mentioned, the recent decision uh, by the director of USGS, Mr. Riley, to suppress the science about polar bears is, is frankly, it's just it's not unexpected given how they've suppressed several reports over the years as they approach this rush to lease for oil and gas in the in the refuge. So they've been going after not just the science in the Arctic, but they've been going after scientists themselves, marginalizing and and uh, and intimidating scientists to the point where they're having to self-censor just to allow their work to ever be published at all. So it's been a, an immense challenge for scientists across the board at Interior. All right. Thank you for that. I will yield back and recognize uh, the chair of the full Natural Resources Committee, Raul Grijalva, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Bittiff, I, uh, good to see you again, Bernadette. And let me ask a question. I, I, and Mr. Clements brought, brought that up in, in his opening comments about that, that the response uh, has to be comprehensive. Uh, to, to the Alaska Natives, the Gretchen people. It has to be a comprehensive response uh, and in order to, 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 to tackle climate change and to mitigate uh, what is possible. And I think much is possible. This administration has, uh, has been essentially an enemy of any effort to try to mitigate and, and try to create some fairness for indigenous people uh, from Alaska all the way through this process. And you and I both have discussed that before. Going forward, can you, one of the things that has to happen in a comprehensive approach is how do we empower uh, indigenous people in Alaska so that we don't get this divide and conquer about who represents uh, uh, native people in Alaska that we get sometimes from, uh, uh, from the elected people, elected uh, uh, people from Alaska in terms of the list on one side and not, and the role of interior in the consultation and, and that, need, that needs to occur. Uh, can you just respond to that and anybody else after uh, Bernadette is done that, that we have time is, uh, I welcome their response as well. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, there's a lot of um, miscommunication. Um, there's corporations and then there's tribes. Um, corporations don't have human rights, we do. And um, our, it's frustrating that we have to come to you guys asking you for your help because our own elected leadership would rather, um, <clears throat> you know, have self-benefit and help their buddies in the oil and gas industry. Um, they no longer represent us. They meet with the oil, they meet with the oil and gas companies more than they meet with our people. And, um, you know, I'm just here to say that we are, we're speaking up for ourselves. We're representing ourselves. Um, and that 
we just appreciate you all so very much. I just, um, I can't tell you how much it means to know that we have people helping us. And that's, that's truly genuine coming from my heart. Thank you. Mr. Clements or anybody else, you, uh, any general response about the kind of this is long Rosemary. question I had? Yeah. Uh, this is a very important question. I have been facing this for decades. And the reality is the process to create that system was not the process that we utilize from our villages and our tribal leadership in the way that we go forward. We were forced upon a process that took a social research project to decimate us. And we cannot use that system to guide the excellence of our communities. I'll, I'll jump in too, uh, Chairman, just to say that this, this administration, uh, in, in agreement with the previous two speakers, this administration has taken almost a 19th century approach to consultation and engagement with Indigenous people. And it's been a challenge in a number of ways, uh, but not least because by suppressing both the science and anyone that might have anything negative to say, uh, they can they can get the the, the drill out to get this stuff out of the ground and it's uh it's appalling and and frankly it's it's the opposite of public service and i think that's where we're also challenged they're supposed to be there to help and they're doing the opposite this is mary i just want to add i think we've just been witness to the poor job that it has taken place um poor public engagement poor tribal engagement um when you have just high cost just to travel out of alaska to travel all the way down to DC, it's cost prohibitive. I think if you have like forums like Zoom, you also have to take into consideration whether or not um, people in the villages have access to even um, connect sure. via the internet. Um, so it's great that um, other, other ways are being thought of, but um, I think there's, it's just a challenging, um, it's just a challenge to, try to get uh, effective uh, tribal consultation. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Huffman, I just wanted to uh, to say that in conjunction with the uh, the forum that you and Mr. Lowenthal have put together, that uh, the Resources Committee is uh, uh, releasing a, a new report entitled The Melting Arctic Climate Change Impacts on People and Wildlife uh, in conjunction with this, uh, this hearing. And it's going to be on the committee, uh, you can get our committee online, and uh, I, I hope that people do that, and we hope to disseminate that so that the issues that have been raised today continue to be issues uh, going into January. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it, and, and the, the panel Thank and you. yourselves. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for your leadership on environmental justice. We had a very important hearing earlier this week on your bill with Congressman McKeon. And I think this conversation that we've had today is a very important continuation uh, because it's the same values and in many, in many cases, the same issues. I wanna thank all of the uh, witnesses for their heartfelt and expert testimony. I wanna thank my colleagues. I'm gonna hand it now back to Chair Lowenthal. Thank you for your leadership, Chair Lowenthal, and, and you've got the final word. Well, Wait a minute. I wanna thank, hello. Oh, I think that Grace has uh, Napolitano. Oh, I'm sorry, Grace. They, they, I wanted to extend that time and they told me that you didn't want it, but we'd love to hear from you. No, not to extend the time. I want to know if anybody of you needed the time. But <laughs> I, I do have some questions, if I may, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Chair. That's Go fine. Ahead. Go ahead. Well, I want to ask anybody and everybody that's on the panel, have you ever been asked about the climate impact on the tribes? to testify on climate change or to offer any input in any legislation coming before the house or in contact with the federal congressional offices or the uh, Bureau of Reclamation or anybody that, that consults with the tribes uh, from anybody. Thank you, Grace. This is Bert Murray. Go ahead. Somebody? Uh, Rosemary. This is Rosemary. 
And okay, go ahead. Uh, I have been approached over the last decade a number of times, uh, but they're not giving us the process where we can speak effectively. We're always limited. Thank you, Rosemary. Oh. I would love to expand upon that. Um, I don't think tribal consultation has changed since I was a little girl. Um, we bear our hearts to people who often have never been to our villages and are often met with stoic faces. And even within um, the panel today, we are forced to work within a structure of five minute intervals. And you are forced to work within the parameters of that. And you are forced to even cut off our elders today when they're burying their hearts, you know, trying to fit a thousand years of human rights into five minutes. And so I would respectfully like to kind of turn the question on its head and ask, um, ask everyone here today to think about what has your experience been with tribal consultation and what would a future look like where there's cooperative relationships with indigenous peoples and a tribal collaboration that's based off of humanity? What would a future look like where we meet and we speak over a pot of salmon stew or caribou meat and share a space um, and not, <laughs> not forced to work in a colonized parameters or space. I agree with you. I agree with you because to, when I was on uh, natural resources uh, as a committee chair, it was always a question with the tribal, with the Native American tribes have the same problems you have. Exactly the same problems, the consultation of the, the uh, agencies listening to them. And uh, somehow we've got to break that pattern and have the people actually affected by the impacts of climate change, although Republicans don't feel there's a climate change that will reveal the true nature. Because I remember seeing some of the bills that were passed by your representative and I asked him, did you consult? And he said, oh yes, these so-and-so tribe is, is for it and so-and-so. And I was wondering why is it just the one face being put to it? But then again, I don't represent the area. But uh, uh, has anybody else got any comment? Well, Grace, to the extent that that question was thrown back at us, maybe I'll jump in ever so briefly, uh, since I had well, the awkward, I had well, the awkward task of. Uh, I have, I'm not done. Then you can okay. answer. Uh, the right. mental health issue is a very important, and the co-chair of the mental health caucus. I would like to know if if you have recorded anything that deals with the tribal deaths. Uh, due to uh, whatever uh, um, suicide or uh, things that are happening because of uh, isolation, because of poverty, because of whatever. That's important to me. And I would like to make sure that all of your testimony is sent to all members of Congress, on, both in the Senate and the House, because we don't hear from you. And if, if they only get a portion of it, then it should be up to you to send it to them directly even though our committee tries, it, it's only within the committee members, not the full committees and not the full house. And yes, five minutes too short, but that's the rules we have to live by. Go ahead, Jared. Just, just on, on that point, um, it is a, a really limiting and unfortunate uh, aspect of this framework. So the, the witness uh, in, invited a broader conversation over salmon stew. I, I would love to do that. And, and let me just uh, accept that invitation. We'll figure out a way to do it when it's safe to do it. But uh, the, the times when I have had tribes in my district, you know, testify within this straight jacketed format, I, I don't learn as much about them as when I go to their reservation or paddle in a dugout canoe or, or take the time to really uh, understand and appreciate um, everything that needs to be heard. So I just want you to know that I, uh, I apologize for the constraints of this format and I definitely will look for ways to, to have a better conversation uh, going forward. I'll, I think- uh, my time. Yeah, my take time. some more time, Grace. Well, uh, I would ask if all the tribes have considered banding together and speaking with one voice. Any answers? The Gwich'in Nation does, we have um, 10 uh, Gwich'in communities in Alaska and four in Canada. And that's the migratory, our ancestors settled us on the migratory route. I know, but um, have you considered also, banding together, all the tribes to speak with one voice? 
we're we're working on it. Um, we uh, in November we invited um, tribes from down in the lower forty eight. We call it the lower forty eight. Um, uh, up to That's up here, but we were not able to That's meet. Gonna it's going to be very important. It's going to be critical because then you all have the same issues and the same impact on your tribes because of the effect on the animals and the forest and whatever. But if you don't speak with one voice, uh, they tend to say, oh, well, it's only part, but I have this other part that says it's okay. So it's got to be united. Yeah. Ms. Grace, I recommend you to follow the work of the Alaska Federation of Natives um, it's the largest statewide native organization in Alaska and represents over 140,000 indigenous people. Um, it was formed in the 60s, but continues to be a forum and voice um, where indigenous people of Does Alaska- Does that include all the tribes? Yes, ma'am. Except no. uh, um, Arctic Regional Slope, they pulled out this year because of, um, we had two, one of, our, one of them is our Kuchin Youth Council member, Kwana Potts. They came before them and discussed climate change. And um, so they pulled out. Well, it would seem to me that if you're, if you're strong enough, united, you can let your own representative to Congress. I yield you're back. Strong enough. All right, thanks. Uh, uh, Chair Lowenthal, back to you for uh, to close us out. Well, again, I just want to thank everyone. I have a th maybe three kind of observations. One is when I was reading everything for today's hearing and they talked about uh, the climate change is impacting uh, the Arctic at twice the amount as the rest of the nation. I learned that it's really three times the amount and it's 50% greater and the speed is going than, than we need. The other one was I, again, I'm struck with the lies, the deception and the anti-science attitude of this administration not dealing with, with, uh, with the facts, with science and the impacts of what oil and gas extraction. And the third point is, I agree with the comments that were made. If we truly want to understand what's going on, we need a field hearing in the Arctic. And I would support you, Chairman Huffman, to do what we can to have it, when things are safer, to have a field hearing there. And, uh, you know, we have field hearings everywhere else. We have not had a field hearing in the Arctic. And that, with that, I, I would like to call this hearing to an end. It has been very, very valuable. Thank you all for attending.